Yeah, it's starting. It's starting live stream. Okay. So, I'll be back in just two minutes. You're all right. But that either you make me the host again, or you you deal with in, in introducing people and so on. Uh, I'll, I'll wait. As yeah, you start, wish. Starting live stream. Okay. I'll be back in just two minutes. <laughs> But that either you make me the host again or you I will host. make you I will make you the host you now. Okay. But uh yeah, as you wish. Okay. Yeah. You need to uh, turn off the sound of the YouTube uh, channel there. You, yeah, you haven't made me the host yet. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay. Okay, there we go. Everybody's in. Oh, Dima. Hi, Dima. Hi. Hey guys, happy new year. Happy yeah, new same year. to you. Happy new year. Hagen, where are you? Are you in... Uh... I'm in Israel. In Israel. Yeah, yeah. Just back since about a week. Okay. Well, wait. Thanks a lot for for good links. Um, the Nobel concert with uh, with uh, Igor Levit was really was really quite something. Yeah, it was, it was good. It was good. Even though I think he's gone crazy. Yeah, it uh, sounded a bit like that. Yeah, <laughs> but interesting. Crazy in what sense? Well, I think he's kind of gone to uh, extremes in the way he, I don't know, you just have to listen to him and, and watch him and he's- oh, uh, Again, send me the link as well, so. I'll, I'll send you the link, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Because I understand he became quite a star in the early days of the, the lockdowns in Germany. Oh, it was, it was amazing. I mean, basically he gave like 50 concerts in a row out of his house uh, over his uh, iPhone uh, <laughs> and, Terrible sound, terrible connection, but it was absolutely phenomenal. I see. Um, but, but he's also, you know, known for his uh, rather extreme political views. So he was, I think, at some point, his life was in danger. Oh, okay. Yeah, because he was getting all kinds of death threat, uh, threats from. Wow. So. Well, he's extremely active on Twitter, and he um, yeah. Don't mind to, to to show his very extreme political opinions on Twitter. So extreme on which side, right or or left? Left. Left. Uh, I see. Okay. In fact, I think that people were upset because when Trump was elected, uh, he was given a concert, and he actually gave a speech about that. How upset he was about uh, that whole fact, and some people got very disappointed because uh, you know. So that was not very appropriate to give speeches like that. Okay, nothing is appropriate anymore in the world. That's right. Gilad, the good science talk is still appropriate. Uh, let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Ellie. Hi, how are you? How are you? Ellie, it's good to see you in this series. You are not a frequent uh, visitor of this uh, lecture series. So well, I only, I only come for the good talks. I see. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, I'll have to run away from the end of your talk, unfortunately. So I, I won't be there for the questions, but I'll listen to them after that. So, Eli, did you come to my talk? I don't remember seeing you. <laughs> now you got into trouble. Uh, let's see. <laughs> That's Peter Wallinus. 
Ah, uh, Peter. Well, good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> likewise, likewise. Hi, Susan. Hello, hello. Good morning. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> ah, Maurizio, good to see you. Milad, this is Maurizio. Did Hi. You, did you get, Hi, Maurizio. Did you get vaccinated, Milad? Sorry? Did you get vaccinated? No, no, no. We can talk about this later. I have uh, strong opinions on this, but uh, okay. that's not for this. Uh, <laughs> I can come. Not for this forum. Vaccine, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you want, you can take my vaccine share. Right. Because I would suggest we wait another minute or so. Numbers still seem to be rising and then we can start. Oh, Kobe. Ben mentioned to people that we are locking the meeting uh, a little bit after the lecture starts. Yeah, that's a good point. I'll mention yeah. that. Have you ever had any trouble? No. Yes, we did. Yes, unfortunately, we did twice. Hello, John. John Portman, hello. Okay, so I think the numbers are stabilizing so we can start. And I would like to welcome all of you. It's great to see you again this year. So happy to happy new year to everyone. And we're starting, starting our series uh, in 2021 with Michael Woodside. And I'll just introduce him briefly, although most of you will know Michael and his background and his work very well. But uh, let me just mention a few points. So Michael actually studied both physics and music at the University of Toronto. And lucky for us, he decided to continue in physics and went for a PhD in Berkeley, where he studied electron transport and nanostructures with Paul McEwen. And again, lucky for us, he then turned to biophysics and did a, Stanf did a postdoc at Stanford. And uh, he studied the, the folding of single nucleic acid molecules with Steve Block. And then um, after a few years, he returned to Canada and he was first at the National Institute of Nanotechnology in Edmonton. <clears throat> and then since 2013, he's a professor in the Department of Physics at the University of Alberta. He's the, the i -Corps chair in biophysics. And so, as you all know, Michael is a pioneer in force spectroscopy. And uh, already as a postdoc, he made a name for himself with, with his work on the folding landscapes of nucleic acids and their dependence on the sequence. And uh, he's been using advanced method development and uh, to, to get very deep physical insight. And this, this combination and this spirit is something he continued when he returned to, to Canada. Uh, where he extended his work to protein folding and misfolding. And uh, one of the things that he's also particularly well known for is that he developed methods to extract transition path times for the folding of nucleic acids and proteins. I think it's fair to say that he's the first who was able to resolve uh, transition paths for folding experimentally. And he's, he's very well known for his, his use of, of very clever advanced physical concepts for the analysis and, for example, the, the extensive testing of theoretical concepts that have been developed for transition paths. 
But he's also been investigating the folding of RNA structures from viruses and viral frame shifting and pseudonauts. And that's something that he, he also started applying to coronavirus recently. But today he will talk about the misfolding of prion-like conversion in single protein molecules. But before we start, a few technical points. I would like to ask you all to keep your microphones muted uh, so that we can minimize background noise. If you have a question, please just use the chat window and write down the question or just say, I have a question there. And then we'll call you in the end to ask the question in person. I would also like to mention that this talk will be recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel. And I would like to invite you to also have a look at the other talks uh, that you can find there um, in case you have missed some of them. I would also like to mention that uh, we will lock the meeting after a few minutes after it starts to uh, prevent any Zoom bombing. And we've had two cases of that in the past. And in case you won't be here until the end of the discussion, I would also like to mention our next lecture in two weeks by Marina Rotnina, who will talk about co-translational co protein folding. But now, Michael, it's great to have you with us today. And we very much look forward to your seminar. And the screen is yours. OK. Thanks so much for that introduction, then. Let's see if I can share my screen. Hopefully that's working. Um, and uh, of course, thanks very much to uh, Ben and Gilad and, and Hagen for putting together this uh, webinar series. It's really been a wonderful way to keep in touch during the disruptions over the last year. Um, so what I would like to do today is tell you about a, uh, I guess, a roughly decade long quest that we've been undertaking to observe misfolding and especially prion-like conversion in single protein molecules. <clears throat> uh -oh. Come on. There we go. Okay, so um, one, of the, one of the characteristic features of many neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, Creutzfeldt-Jakob, and many more, is that, um, there are, that you find these deposits of misfolded protein aggregates in, in the brain tissues. Um, and in fact, uh, misfolded proteins in, are, are linked to a, a wide uh, variety of other diseases too, some of which I've listed down below. But the, the focus of, of, of my talk today is going to be on proteins that are involved in neurodegeneration because these ones show a very startling uh, property and that is that the misfolding can propagate by converting natively folded molecules. So if we start off with some collection of natively folded molecules shown in green and we have a misfolded conformer that comes along in red, uh, then they interact and somehow this converts the native conformer into uh, another copy of the misfolded conformer. Um, and so you end up with this accumulation of misfolded conformers, uh, but the misfolded molecule can then recycle and basically continue this process. So it really acts as a, as a novel type of uh, infectious agent. This is known as a prion. It's a, um, a neologism made up by Stanley Prusner, who is one of the two people who won uh, Nobel Prizes uh, for um, investigating this phenomenon uh, caused by the protein PRP, which was the first, the first protein in which this was seen. And PRP causes the classic prion diseases. Uh, Scrapie, which has been known for centuries, although it wasn't known until last uh, century that it was actually prion disease. Kuru, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, fatal familial insomnia, chronic wasting disease, bo bovine spongiform encephalopathy, so mad cow disease, etc. Um, now, although it was first seen in PRP, it's actually uh, since been recognized that uh, prion-like behavior with this kind of co uh, conversion that you see in this, this diagram up here is actually seen with um, several other proteins involved in neurodegeneration, including A beta, tau, alpha synuclein, superoxide dismutase 1, TDP43, and several others. Um, the, the, the problem is that the, mis, the mechanisms by which uh, misfolding occurs, and in, partic in particular how the, the, it converts native conformers, these remain quite uh, uncertain. And it, this may not be actually that surprising when you think about it, because misfolding is an incredibly complicated process. We've been studying um, uh, the native folding process for well over half a century, 
I guess more like three quarters of a century now. Um, and there's still lots of things for us to learn about that. Uh, but misfolding involves many other processes all occurring at the same time. Uh, and so because of this heterogeneity, it's actually quite difficult to probe and understand what are the key events during uh, misfolding. However, this, this heterogeneity also makes it actually very well suited for studying with single molecule methods. And that's because by avoiding uh, ensemble averaging, uh, right, measuring one molecule at a time, we can get at several important features. First of all, we can see directly uh, rare or transient events that would be otherwise lost in an ensemble average. These might be important for triggering some rare process during misfolding. We can also distinguish and characterize subpopulations within heterogeneous mixtures, which of course we know are, are taking place in, in, in misfolding and aggregation. And most importantly, we can follow a single molecule as it switches between different conformations to figure out uh, the mechanisms of, of the misfolding. And of course, we can actually not just uh, figure out what it's switching into, but look at what's going on within these little arrows. So that would be the transition paths that Ben mentioned in the introduction. Now, the method that we're using to, uh, to approach this is um, for spectroscopy. And there's been a couple of wonderful talks uh, previously in this series by um, Matthias Reif and Susan Marcusi, uh, who've introduced this. Uh, but in, just in case you haven't seen those talks, um, uh, the, the basic idea is illustrated here. We take the protein we want to study, uh, we grab onto it with handles attached to, in this case, beads held in optical tweezers, uh, and then we can move the traps apart uh, to stretch out the handles and apply force to the protein. And as we ramp this force up, at some point pieces of the protein will start unfolding, and when they do, they get stretched out under force, so you see a change in the length. So by measuring this, uh, the, the extension of the molecule, this reports directly on the instantaneous structure of the protein by telling us how much of it has been unfolded. <clears throat> um, so just to show you how, how the, how the, what this looks like in data, we can take a, uh, one, one of the types of measurements we do is we just take our traps and we move them apart at constant speed to stretch out the handles and apply force. And here I'm going to show you an example of, uh, of a measurement for, on the um, prion protein from hamsters, which is a nice model organism. And what we see is that at low force, you see this nonlinear increase, but it's basically featureless. And that's actually not so interesting. We're just, here we're just stretching out the DNA handles. And then there's a, an abrupt uh, jump in extension and force, and that's when the protein unfolds. And then now it's in the unfolded state, and we keep on stretching out everything out. Uh, we can go back down, and you see it retraces its path along the unfolded and folded states. But the, uh, the refolding doesn't match up quite exactly with the unfolding. So there's some hysteresis. And that's just because we're, we're ramping this fast enough that it's, the system is not in equilibrium. Now, of course, we can keep on doing this, unfold and refold and unfold and refold many times until the, the tether breaks. So here is 100 pulls from the same molecule all overlaid on top of each other. And as you can see, they, they all follow these two branches for the folded and unfolded states. But the force at which it unfolds varies from pull to pull, and that's because it's a stochastic process. Now, we can fit the length change to see if that matches what we expect from the protein. So we do this by fitting these uh, branches for the, un for the folded state to a worm-like chain polymer, uh, which just fits the polymer elasticity of the, of the DNA handles up here. And then we can have a second worm-like chain in series with that, which is for the unfolded protein once it's unfolded. And you can see they fit really nicely. And from that, we can pull out the change in the contour length, in this case, 34.3 nanometers, and compare that to what we expect from the, uh, the NMR structure of this very same construct, uh, which, in fact, matches it perfectly. OK, so this is telling us that, in this case, this protein is, is natively folded each time we, we unfold it. Now, instead of, of ramping the force back up and down and up and down and up and down repeatedly, we can, another kind of measurement we can do is we can pull it up to somewhere, or say, around 10 piconewtons, where it can coexist in these two different states, and then just sit there at constant force and watch it hop back and forth. So that's shown here. You can see it's hopping back and forth between a high extension state where it's unfolded and a low extension state where it's folded. Um, and so again, we see apparently two-state folding, and you can see these two states very nicely. Of course, we can also 
titrate the force. So at higher forces, it's more unfolded. As you go down in force, you see it's more folded. OK, so these are the kinds of measurements uh, we're going to be using uh, and I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and so let's have a look at what we can find out uh, using them um, in, this, in this work that we've been doing for the last uh, decade almost, um, trying to piece together how these uh, neurodegeneration linked proteins misfold and in particular uh, how they're able to convert. Uh, and so I'm going to start by talking about our work on, on uh, PRP. Um, so as I mentioned, this causes prion diseases. It's a family of, of fatal progressive neurodegenerative diseases that, that they're also known as transmissible spongiform encephalopathies because one of the key features is you get these vacuoles in the brain tissue. You get spongy brain tissue developing. And there's a whole series of them in, uh, in various animals and humans. Um, they're all caused by this protein PRP, which is highly conserved across the animal kingdom. It's membrane anchored, but we don't actually know what it really does. Now, this is, of course, infamous because of the mad cow um, uh, uh, crisis that happened uh, a few decades ago. So mad cow disease was first identified in, in the UK in 86, and they had about 185,000 confirmed cases of the disease. It almost wiped out the British beef industry. It's characterized by <coughs> um, uh, uh, extreme sensitivity to touch and sound and loss of balance and, and eventual death. Now, what was very startling about this is that it turns out that ingesting infected meat can cause a variant of this very rare uh, disease, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, in humans. And although there's only been roughly 230 cases so far worldwide, um, a relatively recent study showed that there's many tens of thousands of people in the UK alone who actually are infected with prions, even though they are currently asymptomatic. Um, so the key here is that in this disease, the native structure, which is mostly helical, it converts into a, a, a beta-rich oligomer whose structure we still do not know. Um, and this isoform is very highly stable, and it's self-replicating, and it's toxic to neurons. So the question we're interested in understanding is how does misfolded PRP form and propagate? Uh, and one of the uh, early ideas was that um, the, the, there's on pathway intermediates, something that was hypothesized to be PRP star, uh, which plays, it was suggested to play a critical role in conversion. And so the idea was that you would go from uh, a partially unfolded intermediate into this misfolded state, and then that would help, so you could recruit more molecules out of this partially unfolded state. Um, and over the years, a number of proposals have been made for this intermediate state in, in fact, almost all different parts of the protein. But actually, there's other studies that, that um, showed that they saw no evidence for, for intermediates. So it's fair to say that there's a fair, uh, that, that the evidence for this proposal is, is uh, conflicting. Um, so we wanted to look at this carefully with our single molecule data. And as you can see in this, in this trace, in this record here, uh, there's really no evidence for an intermediate state uh, in our measurements for the, the hamster protein. Um, now, just to remind you what, uh, what it would look like if there were an intermediate, here's uh, measurements of a DNA hairpin where we engineered the sequence. We engineered blocks of GC and AT base pairs to produce an intermediate at this boundary here between the ATs and the GCs. And as you can see, you get this uh, little bump in the histogram for the extensions, and you can see the, these uh, fluctuations, these transient fluctuations into the intermediate state out of both the native state, the unfolded state, and, and in fact, even a little step in the transitions between the two. Uh, so we were actually able to place some pretty stringent um, uh, boundaries showing that if there is any such intermediate in the Syrian hamster protein, it must be extremely short-lived and very rare, less than 100 microseconds lifetime and less than 10 to the minus 5 occupancy. Now, while looking for this intermediate, we actually saw many uh, off-pathway intermediates. Uh, and it might not be uh, immediately obvious at first, but our claim is that these little spikes down from the unfolded state are, in fact, intermediate states. Uh, they become a little bit clearer if we zoom in. This is still not super convincing, in part because their lifetime is around on, the, on the same order as the fluctuations of, the, of our system here in the unfolded state. 
But we can do a careful analysis of the statistics of these fluctuations. So, and by measuring what we see for the extension, if we measure the same construct but lacking the protein. So this ten tells us, so we take a, a histogram of this, obviously nothing has happened, right? This is a, just a single length. Um, and that histogram is shown in black here. Now I've switched to a, a, um, uh, a log scale so that we can see the, the, dis the differences more easily. And we can fit this to the point spread function. So that's just the, the response of our instrument. Um, so how it's, how it, uh, the, yeah, um, the response of the instrument. And you can see that it, that it fits very well down to the counting noise, right? We have very little residual. But if we extract the data now from this nominally unfolded state and we fit it to the point spread function, we see that there's a very definite residual. And in fact, if you fit that residual to the point spread function, you find that you need two more point spread functions. So in fact, there's two different misfolded states. They're just really quite rare, uh, less than 1% of the time occupied. And they're also very briefly occupied. Uh, but they're happening very, ra very frequently, right? So there's frequent short-lived attempts to fold into these unstable non-native structures. There's also, I had a very uh, patient student who parsed the data and roughly once every 10 minutes, he saw this roughly 50 mill millisecond long uh, state, which is obviously different from these other two. So there's an, uh, yet another misfolded state there. All anyway, right, so this allows us to put together this picture of the folding pathways and misfolding pathways where there's no on-pathway intermediate for the hamster PRP monomer. Um, there are a number of misfolded states, uh, but they're, and they all come out of the unfolded state, but they're not stable in the monomer. Now this is perhaps not surprising because it's long been believed that uh, misfolded PRP is actually only stable in the context of oligomers. Um, and certainly it's only seen within uh, aggregates in the disease. So this led us to have a look at what happens when we start um, having PRP interact with itself. And as a first step, we started, we studied uh, dimers as minimal aggregates. Uh, so the, the idea is shown here, instead of pulling just on a single PRP, we made a tandem repeat dimer, so they're just linked together covalently and pulled on that. Now just to remind you, right, with the monomeric, uh, form, we just get these single rips in both uh, unfolding and refolding. Now, if we had actually truly this picture that I show here, we have two independently folded monomer domains, then what we'd expect to see, this is not real data, this is fake data, uh, we would expect to see is just two in, uh, independent rips that look basically identical. And this has been seen in hundreds of papers using uh, tandem repeat proteins in, in pulling experiments. But what we actually saw was something quite different. Uh, so this is telling us these are not independent monomers, it's some different structure, and in fact it's been converted to this, in this case, a stable misfolded form. Uh, now when we, when we repeat the pulling many times, we actually see two different populations, which for convenience are just called type A and type B. One of them has this big rip down here, uh, the other one has just a series of very subtle things going on. Uh, but we never ever saw any kind of native folding. Now looking at these curves, we can uh, identify a number of different uh, unfolding transitions, uh, which is telling us that here now we do have uh, multiple intermediate states. So there's at least three different types that are obvious here. We can fit the length changes, just like I showed you earlier. So in this case, we get 81 nanometers full of full unfolding. And if you compare that to natively folded PRP, this is actually just under two and a half times the size. You might wonder how that's possible, and that's because the, the, uh, the N-terminal domain of PRP has uh, a bunch of unfolded, has an unfolded uh, uh, piece to it. Um, and so this is just telling us that that unfolded uh, part of the protein is actually now getting sequestered into the, into the misfolded dimer. Uh, there's another one that's, uh, there's another state that's short, so it's about half the size of the regular uh, native folding, and that's present in both of these types of curves. There's, of course, this state here, which is only present in type B. That's got a length of about one and a half times uh, the normal native fold. And then it turns out that it's slightly subtle, but there's an extra state here. It's, it's much harder to detect over here, but we've done another analysis, which I don't have time to show you, which does indeed show that, that it is present in these curves too. We're just not seeing discrete rips because it turns out it's got very rapid transitions. Um, now, 
The refolding, as it turns out, looks just like type B, so you end up in state two. And then at, uh, at when, you, when you let it sit at zero force, it changes slowly into the state one here. So you get more and more of that the longer you let it refold. So that tells us that these, uh, these pathways look like so. You've got these five states. They are sequential, and you get these two different unfolding pathways depending on whether you're starting in one or two. Now, um, the, with this data, we became, of course, very interested looking at how the, the landscape for the misfolding um, differs from uh, the landscape for native folding. And this is where uh, we make use of some of the uh, great things that you can do with force spectroscopy measurements. So just to remind you, um, the, uh, the energy landscape theory gives us our physical framework for understanding how folding works. Uh, and, and it describes folding in terms of a dis diffusive search over a conformational energy landscape. So you, you, if you imagine plotting the, the energy of the, of the um, protein as a function of all possible conformations, so here the xy plane would be all the different possible conformations, and the z-axis would be the energy. And then you start off in this high energy unfolded state, and then you diffuse over the surface to find the folded state. Um, now, of course, this, this, in actuality, this is a very high dimensional uh, surface because there's a huge number of degrees of freedom, even in a very small protein. Uh, and in ex experimentally, we can't actually follow all of those degrees of freedom. Typically, we end up just following a single uh, uh, observable. And so what, what we end up looking at is a projection of this energy landscape onto uh, the um, reaction coordinate, as it's called, which is related to our observables. So you get a, a free energy profile that looks somewhat like that where you've got some barrier and maybe there's an intermediate state in between. Uh, and one of the great things about force spectroscopy is that it allows you a number of different ways of, of measuring uh, energy landscapes and the diffusion over them. And one of these ways is based on looking at the distribution of unfolding forces that you can see here. Uh, so the idea is illustrated on, on the left here. Um, so at zero force, this, this is a stable protein. It's got a relatively high barrier for unfolding, and so it doesn't unfold spontaneously. Now this barrier, so this barrier's got some height, delta G double dagger, and it's located some distance along the reaction coordinate away from the folded state. Now when we apply force, the effect of that is actually to tilt this landscape along the, the reaction coordinate, which is extension. And so that lowers the barrier, as you can see here. It, it also slightly shifts the barrier, but that's a second order effect. The big thing is that it lowers this barrier. And so as your force gets, gets higher and higher, at some point now this barrier is low enough that you can get spontaneous uh, uh, crossing of the barrier, and you'll start, you'll start seeing unfolding. As you keep on lowering this barrier as I ramp up the force, I get more and more molecules that are unfolding until everything is eventually unfolded. So the shape of the distribution of unfolding forces ends up being related to the shape of this landscape. And in certain limits, so certain, under certain approximations, you can actually um, uh, analytically uh, describe the distribution that you expect so this is, this is the distribution you would expect for a linear cubic shape of the, of the landscape, which is what's illustrated over here. So we basically take those data, we turn it into a, a um, distribution, we fit it to this functional form, you can see it fits pretty nicely, and then we pull out these parameters, uh, the top two implicitly define the shape of the landscape, and then the bottom one here, this rate uh, tells us about the, uh, the kinetics. And what's one of the cool things about this is that uh, knowing the shape of the landscape and the rates, we can go back to some classic chemical physics uh, from, I guess, uh, 80 years ago um, to extract the diffusion coefficient. So this is uh, cr using Cromer's theory where we get the diffusion coefficient by knowing what the stiffness of the well and the barrier are and the height of that barrier and the rate at which it's going over it. Um, so the reason this is interesting is because this diffusion coefficient is effectively setting the speed of the microscopic motions over the landscape, and it's reflecting the, the internal friction within the protein that's slowing things down. Um, and so in terms of these parameters, we get this expression here. And so just plugging those in for the monomer, we find that it's about 10 to the 6 nanometers squared per second, which is a little bit slower than what previous work by uh, Eaton and, uh, and uh, Ben Schuller and many others have shown for uh, unfolded proteins, but that actually makes sense because we're now measuring it for, the, uh, for going over the barrier. Of course, what we're really interested to see is how does that differ in the, um, in the misfolded protein. So we can go back to our 
our, our dire misfolding. If you recall, we had this uh, very uh, definite, distinct uh, sequential pathway. So we can actually look at each of these, and as it turns out, they're all independent. So we can look at each of these um, um, transitions and uh, study them as a two-state system uh, and reconstruct everything pairwise. So we take the distribution for unfolding state one, for example, fit that to get the, the height and the distance, and then we also get the the, the relative free energy of, of, of these two states from the, the rates and also the populations of those two states. We do the same thing for the unfolding going from two to three. We can't see from two to three to four, but then we can see from four to unfolded state. And so we piece it all together and we get this landscape as shown over here. Uh, and there's some, some very interesting aspects of this. First of all, comparing to the monomer, uh, we find that, in fact, the misfolded dimer is more stable than two natively folded dimers, uh, monomers. Uh, so the, this is, in fact, the thermodynamic minimum state for the dimer. Um, but also, if we apply that same uh, the, uh, analysis to get the diffusion coefficient, we find that the diffusion coefficient is uh, only 1,000 instead of a million. So it's 1,000 times slower than for native folding. Um, so now, actually, this led us to the, one issue is that the, the Cromer's analysis that I showed back here, um, this, of course, depends exponentially on the barrier height. So it's quite sensitive to errors in, in how well you can determine the barrier height. So we, we always have to be a little bit careful about that. Um, and that, uh, that motivated us to uh, have a look at a, something that would gives you a, a much more reliable measure of the diffusion coefficient. And that's actually uh, looking at transition path times, which you heard uh, about in, in Bill Eaton's talk a few months ago. Um, so transition paths, just to remind you, are just the brief part of the trajectory where you're cro actually going over the top of the energy barrier. Um, so normally, these are quite short. They're on the, the few microsecond time scale. Uh, and when we tried to look at it for the PRP monomer in a previous paper, we were unable to see it. It was below the resolution of our instrument. However, uh, the notion is that now the diffusion is a thousand times slower. So instead of being on the microsecond time scale, it should be on the millisecond time scale. And that should be much more easy to uh, see directly. And indeed, when we uh, looked at the transitions between states, we saw that they were not just you know, square waves, uh, not just abrupt you can see that they take a finite amount of time. And in this case, it's on the order of a millisecond. So we were able to basically measure a whole bunch of these transitions and pull out a, a distribution of the transition times um, and then uh, uh, d extract what the diffusion coefficient is from, from two different properties. One of them is the average transition time, which in this case is half a millisecond. And the, the diffusion coefficient implied by that is 2,000 nanometers squared per second. The other approach is to fit this, um, this distribution to a, uh, um, <clears throat> a theory. Again, in both of these um, theories are assuming that we have a, a, a harmonic barrier. Um, but again, it fits very nicely. And you get a number that agrees pretty well uh, with what we got from the average time and also with what we got from uh, Cromer's theory. So this is all confirming that we really do have um, surprisingly slow diffusion in the misfolding of the same protein that folds uh, that has much faster diffusion in uh, in native folding. Uh, so putting to the, the picture together, um, we can compare the landscapes for native and uh, folding and misfolding of of PRP hamster PRP, um, and you can see that. So this shows you this is the. Uh, um, uh, uh, thermodynamic minimum down there. Now, the, these curves are all very smooth, but of course, what I've just shown you is that really, I, I should be showing this as a whole lot of roughness, right? That we're getting a, a lot of extra friction from the, presumably from the non-native interactions that are roughening this landscape by a localized traps and barriers. Uh, and you can, we can estimate the size of this roughness using a classic theory from Robert Swansig uh, at, at roughly two to three k, uh, kT. Um, and this actually validates this, this long-standing hypothesis that, that misfolding landscapes really are quite rough. Now, um, so we've, we've, uh, th this is, we've gone into a lot of detail about, about misfolding in NPRP and learned lots of things, um, but we're still not really able to address that ultimate goal that I started off with, which was trying to observe a single misfolded protein molecule that comes into contact with a natively folded one and then convinces it to convert which we could then, of course, detect because there would be some change in the unfolding properties. 
Um, the, and in fact, it turns out that this is very challenging uh, because, as you saw, the misfold estates are only stable in, in dimers or larger aggregates. Now, we, we thought about trying to use our misfolded dimers in, in the place of this, this little blob here. And so that would mean making a complicated construct where we've got a misfolded dimer that's sort of linked to then to a, a, a native monomer. Um, the problem is that it's actually, we were actually unable to show that these uh, misfolded dimers can, can actually propagate their misfolding. So it was unclear whether it, it would work. Um, second of all, uh, there's actually strong evidence that uh, it might not work because um, uh, it's, it's suspect, well, recombinant PRP, which is what we're using, of course, it turns out that it's extremely difficult to make infectious prions with, with recombinant PRP. It took decades of effort to find the very special conditions uh, that allowed you to do this. And then thirdly, uh, if we wanted to say, instead of using the recombinant PRP, to use some kind of infectious, uh, actual infectious molecule, uh, that actually raises the, the need for um, biocontainment, which is you know, just under level three. So, and that's unfortunately not, not possible for our tweezers as it stands. So this sort of let, led us to believe that we would not be able to, to achieve the goal that we had wanted to achieve with PRP. Um, and uh, suggested that uh, there might be a better candidate for observing direct, uh, directly observing conversion. And that's why we switched to looking at superoxide dismutase 1, which is associated with ALS. So this is a, a cytosolic antioxidant. Um, it's natively, it's a homodimeric beta barrel. It's got eight parallel, anti-parallel beta strands. Uh, and each subunit binds one copper ion and one zinc ion. The zinc ion imparts stability, and the copper ion is required for uh, uh, its enzymatic activity. Um, now, there are numerous, about, I think it's about over 160 um, mutations that have been linked to familial ALS. Uh, and also, even in sporadic ALS, which is, of course, the most common form, about 90% of the disease is sporadic. Um, that you see deposits of misfolded uh, sod are very commonly seen. Um, as it turns out, the, the uh, hollow, so the methylated um, enzyme is, is quite stable and resistant to aggregation, but uh, if you demethylate it and reduce it, um, then these, the monomers um, are, it, it actually tends to monomerize, it can monomerize, uh, and the, the reduced APO monomers are actually very likely to, they're much more likely to misfold. They form fibrils and are even suggested to be toxic in vivo. And of course, the, the real reason that we are focusing on this is that it's been shown uh, to have, uh, to undergo prion-like propagation of misfolding within and between cells. Now, it, it, SOD1 has been studied um, extensively in uh, en uh, ensemble using ensemble methods, uh, in particular by the Oliveberg group. Um, and they, their work suggests that it's a, it's a two-state folding for the monomer, and then you have an extra state for the, the two monomers associated into the dimer. Although some other studies have suggested it might be more complex with, with some intermediates. Um, the misfolding, however, is much less well understood. Um, there's been some work uh, looking at transient misfolded oligomers in excited state NMR, uh, and uh, uh, other work has suggested that the large loops uh, probably play a, a key role in the misfolding, uh, and there's a suggestion, again, that in this case um, there may be some high-energy intermediates that are important for the, the misfolding process. But a great number of important questions remain uns, uh, uh, unresolved. Uh, and the three that we are most interested in is um, what is the misfolding mechanism here? How does the misfolding propagate? And, and can we show that it actually does at the single molecule level? And what are the ro roles of intermediates in these processes and mutations? Um, so the approach we took was basically exactly the same. So here it's the same, uh, the same illustration, except I've replaced PRP with with uh, the uh, with sod one, and we started off looking at the dimer because that's its 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 natural form, and we but we linked the dimers to the two monomer units together with a, an unstructured peptide so that they don't fall apart when we pull we we unfold the protein, um, and then we're doing this in the apo reduced state, and so you can see in this case there's three unfolding transitions, uh, which is naively what we would expect, right? The 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 basic idea was that you would get, um, you'd get monomerization followed by unfolding of each domain. Uh, we can measure the length change. It's about 112 nanometers. 
And that actually matches very nicely with uh, what you expect from the crystal structure. Um, but the problem comes when we start looking at the length changes in these intermediates, because uh, the standard picture of dimer unfolding, as I mentioned, it should be monomerization, which gives you a length of only 4 nanometers, followed by two 54 nanometer uh, changes. And here, our first unfolding rip has 50 nanometers, so it's far too big. And it's telling us that part of the, like, the protein must be unfolding at the same time that it's, it's monomerizing. So we're getting partial unfolding. So this prompted us to have a look at the monomer alone uh, to figure out what it's doing. So looking at a monomer alone, we can see that the total length change matches what we would expect quite nicely. So that's good. But indeed, we see multiple metastable intermediates uh, in, in, in between the folded and unfolded states. Um, in fact, it's variable. When we repeat the measurement, we see different numbers between 1 and 5, but never 0. In fact, not only is the number of intermediates different, but the lengths that we see differ from one pull to the next. So here's three representative pulls. Uh, however, as you do more and more, you, you repeat the pulls more and more, you'll notice that many of these numbers tend to repeat. So this means that by looking at the distribution of all the numbers we see, we can uh, start to identify the length changes that are uh, associated with, with specific intermediates. So here's a distribution of the cumulative unfolded contour length. So that means that we're looking at the, 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 un, the contour length of unfolded protein at every time we see a rip. So a single curve may contribute multiple uh, points to this histogram. Um, and we can identify multiple peaks. Uh, in fact, there's eight peaks here uh, before we show no residual. Uh, these two, so because this is cumulative, remember that means that it unfolds in this way. So these are the last two peaks to unfold. Uh, and of course, since we see eight states and there's eight beta strands, there, it's highly suggestive that maybe we're seeing each strand unfold. Uh, we can repeat the analysis with the refolding curves. We see roughly the same kind of thing. Uh, and in fact, the patterns of intermediates are the same. The variable number of intermediate states is also the same. And so we can do the same kind of distribution and fit it again. And as I said before, right, because this is cumulative, but now we're refolding. So these two form first in that case. Um, so we're seeing actually similar sets of uh, intermediates visited both during both unfolding and refolding. Um, and so now we can actually summarize this, this work by, by mapping out the transitions between the states uh, to show how the, the, the protein is navigating uh, through all these different intermediates. So, so we first take all these intermediates and we number them. So we just give them an identity based on uh, the length that's associated. Then we go to each uh, uh, force extension curve, and we associate, so we, you know, we figure out what this contour length is, and we associate that to one of these states. So we basically turn this into a state trajectory, and in this case it goes from folded to the I8, I4, I2, and then unfolded. And then we repeat this for all of the thousands of curves that we've, that we've measured to build up the transition map for all the pairwise transitions. So for unfolding, so there's roughly 6,000 curves uh, in total, a bit over 3,000 each way. So for unfolding, it looks like this. The, the, the line widths actually indicate all the different, uh, indicate, sorry, indicate the, the probabilities or the likelihood of that transition. And you're seeing all the different transitions. It's obviously quite complicated. And then for refolding, it's not quite the mirror image, but very similar. Um, so the fact that there's this very large number of possible pathways through all the different intermediates and, and it's, it, the behavior is near equilibrium um, suggests that what we have here is a very complicated energy surface with a whole bunch of small traps and relatively small barriers between them. Now, of course, this kind of analysis, while we can see, we can identify lots and lots of, of intermediates, it doesn't really tell us what they are. So to get some kind of inkling of that, um, we uh, did this analysis, which I'll sh just show you. And it's based on the, the idea that, well, because there's eight states here and there's eight, uh, there's eight uh, um, uh, strands, that this, the, the idea is that what we're seeing is sort of strand-wise unfolding or refolding of, of the molecule. So we're going to assume that the intermediates involve uh, only you know, the addition or removal of individual beta strands, and then we, we start off by enumerating all the possible combinations for the strands in the native fold. 
And then we match these length changes that we calculate for each of those possibilities to the state seen in each given force extension curve to see what structures are possible. So here I've listed the um, unfolded contour lengths for the three intermediates in one particular force extension curve. And if we look at which structures are, are, can be linked to those, so this, th this notation means that strands one through six are folded. This notation means strands five through eight are folded. Um, and the black indicates the uncertainty in the, in the length from the NMR structures, and the gray indicates the uh, uncertainty that we add in from the, um, from the single molecule data. Uh, so, so then we're looking for things that overlap with uh, these, these measurements. Uh, so in, each, in this case, say we've got three possibilities. In this case, we've got four. In this case, we've got four. Then we know the fact that you know, we, go from, we, we go sequentially through these states. So we basically determine which sequences of states are possible given this ansatz that we're having um, strand-wise unfolding and refolding to see what are the most likely structures for each of these states. So the blue paths are non-productive because you can see here I unfold strands 7 and 8, and then I unfold strands uh, 1 and 2, but I can't get from uh, here to here, for example, or from here to here, because that means I have to unfold these strands while at the same time refolding those two. Uh, and that's not allowed by our, our, our ansatz. So the, there's, there's the only pathways through here go down below, like so. Um, and then we repeat this for over 6,000 force extension curves in both directions to figure out what's the minimal set of structures that we need to explain the observations. And that picture shows here, uh, where it starts unfolding from the C-terminus, and then you get a split of various possibilities for the combinations of different things. But you know, first uh, strand 8, then strands 7 and 1, 6, et cetera. Um, and uh, so these intermediates, as you know, they correspond to the folding unfolding of each of the beta strands, and that those states that I showed you earlier as being the first to, to unfold, uh, first to refold and the last to unfold, what we call the stable core, are, are these ones here. Um, now, that analysis applied to about 95% of what we saw, but roughly 5% actually showed a total length change that was not what you expect for native sod. Just telling us, uh, so, so now some of, they, they had intermediates, right, and, and many of these were the same as the stable cores we saw in native folding, but these lengths are different. So we're, we have different low force states. So this is telling us that it's this monomer is forming metastable misfolded structures, which is already an improvement over PRP, right, because now we can detect them, that we can see the misfolded structures and characterize them. Um, now, these misfolded states last for seconds. They do decay on the time scale of roughly six seconds. Um, and looking at the length changes, we actually identify at least three different ones with three different lengths, three different misfolded states. Um, if we analyze the intermediates that we see along the pathways for unfolding each of the, for all of these states, we find that they show many of the same uh, intermediates that we saw in native folding, especially these three uh, states from the uh, native, the stable native core, which is suggesting to us that the misfolding occurs after that stable core has formed, but before the formation of the dimer interface. And this is consistent with this notion uh, that existed previously that uh, the loops are actually prone to misfolding. Now, because we put together this, um, this pathway, right, showing how everything uh, the sequence of events, we can actually do the same kind of network analysis for our misfolding curves to figure out what was the last point on that pathway that it was native. So what's the branching point? So where did it leave the native pathway? And so when you look at those states, you see these four states, and locating them on this map here indicates that uh, the misfolded states indeed form before, mostly before, either loop four uh, is, is folded or loop seven is folded. All right, so now that we understand what the monomer is doing, we can revisit what's going on in the dimer. Uh, so our, if uh, recall, our problem is that this, this rip, first rip here was far too long, so we had to have um, partial unfolding of the monomers. Um, and if you recall, what we just saw was that this strand eight and loop seven were the weakest part of the monomer. They're actually quite near the interface of the dimer, so it's not surprising that 
it, these are might be likely to unfold when the dimer interface is broken, leading to some a picture that might look like so. Um, so now when we look at lots of, of the monomer on uh, the dimer unfolding curves and refolding curves, you see a number of intermediates, just like we talked about before. And it, it, broadly, the, the whole thing is very similar to what we saw with the monomer. There's low, broad barriers in the energy landscape. There's lots of intermediates. I'm not going to take you through this, the gory detail. Um, the interesting things, there's two really interesting things that we saw from the, the, the dimer. The first is that the dimer interface appears to increase the cooperativity because we have fewer intermediates than we would expect if the monomers were folding independently. So this was our distribution of the number of, of, of intermediates we saw in monomer unfolding. So if you have two independent monomers, you can just calculate what you expect. It's that red curve. But what we observed in the dimer was actually significantly smaller than that. Um, so this is telling us that, yes, the dimer interface increases the cooperativity, or, or we assume that the dimer interface increases the cooperativity. Now, to, to show that, yes, it's at the interface, we first showed that, um, that if we look at the first step in refolding, so you're starting in the unfolded state and refolding, uh, obviously, there's no interface, and, and the parts of the protein that are, that are going to make the interface, they're, they're not there yet. So you would not expect any change, and indeed, you don't see any change. It's basically the same for monomers and dimers. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the first uh, unfolding rip, so you start in uh, the native state and you unfold it, we can predict what length changes we would see if we had independent monomers, and that would be this, this green, this pastel green distribution. And the same thing is true. This would be the, the distribution for refolding into the uh, N. Uh, but what we observe for dimers uh, is actually quite different. It's much longer. So indeed, this uh, dimer interface is increasing the cooperativity. All right. Now, the other thing it does is that it seems to change the misfolding. So we, just like in the, in the monomer, we still detect misfolding directly. Uh, it's metastable uh, via these, these non-native length changes. Um, the misfolding occurs late in the refolding from the transition maps, but there's less of it than we would expect. So recall that in the monomer, we had roughly 5% misfolding. So in independent monomers, we, we'd expect just under 10%, but actually we only see 5%. So this dimer interface is reducing the misfolding, which actually makes uh, decent sense uh, in terms of our, our, the picture that we had, that the misfolding was largely uh, involving these, um, these loops, because the, the interface, you can imagine that the interface would help to organize those loops and help them find uh, the, uh, the, the correct native structure. Now, OK, so this still doesn't take us to pre-unlike misfolding. Uh, we're just looking at uh, non pre and this is just uh, how the, the spontaneous, how the, how, how the protein spontaneously misfolds. What about conversion? So to look at this, um, we uh, started looking at some of the um, point mutants. So there's a huge number of point mutant mutants and truncation mutants and insertion mutants, etc. And, and deletion mutants uh, that are associated uh, with uh, familial ALS. Um, and in particular, a few of these, uh, in particular uh, G127X shown here, which is a truncation mutant, and then G85R shown here, um, which is a substitution, these have been shown to uh, not just misfold, but also propagate the misfolding to wild type sod. Um, so our idea is the following, we make a heterodimer where we link the wild type, a wild type monomer to a mutant monomer through an unstructured polypeptide chain, um, and then look for templated conversion of the wild type domain by the mutant. So we look for this to copy itself. Um, and so we started off by doing this with G127X. So the idea is shown here. We're pulling on the monomer just like we did before, but now we've attached via this 50 amino acid long linker a G127X domain. Now this is just sort of dangling freely. We're not pulling on it, applying any force, so it's just free to bounce around and interact with, with the monomer. But we can uh, pull the monomer apart every so often to interrogate it and see what's happened. If you recall, with the monomer alone, we saw only 5% misfolded. But in this construct, the, the misfolding has increased tenfold to over 50%. Right? All of these things down here are misfolded. So this is telling us that, yeah, that, that domain is really uh, inducing 
the, um, the, 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 the wild type domain to make uh, a misfolded structure. Um, and in fact, we can, we can identify at least four different peaks, so four different, uh, four different uh, uh, things going on here, although one of them is clearly uh, the, the dominant one. Um, interestingly, well, we can, if we replace the, the mutant domain with another wild type domain that's just bouncing around freely, uh, you'll notice that the misfolding is, is, is basically abolished. We have a, a little bit of stuff going on at 30 nanometers, but as it turns out, that's also one of the misfolded states that you see normally. So it, it's a bit more common than normal, but, and it's unclear whether this is actually partially native or misfolded. At the moment, we still need to, to do a bit more work on that. But the point is that about, uh, I think, 80 or 85% of the time, it's in the native structure, whereas here, it's only about 50, uh, under 50% of the time. So that's telling us that, yes, this is, in fact, coming from that misfolded domain. Um, oops, sorry. Um, now, uh, we can also, even more exciting, we can, in fact, observe force extension curves where it folds up natively. So that's shown in these black curves here. But when we subsequently unfold it, it's actually starting from a misfolded state. Um, so right where, where the length change is shorter. So this is telling us that actually we are, we are directly seeing a single molecule as it is first, it folds up natively. And then later, a few seconds later, it's now been uh, converted into the uh, misfolded structure. Now, uh, there's one other aspect to this, which is that uh, the prion-like conversion really should be templated by the misfolded domain. So that means that if we put on a different, uh, a, a, diff a, 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 a misfolded domain that, that is, is in a different structure, uh, then we end up seeing different misfolding in the wild-type domain that's induced by that. And so to do this, we actually made a new construct where instead of G127X, we have G85R. Recall the reason we're using these two is because these are the ones for which we know for certain that they are able to convert wild type sod from previous work. And so we're going to look to see if the conversion ends up looking different with this domain than with this domain. Um, and in fact, you, we can already see that, yes, it does look different. Uh, there's the misfolding is is much much more prominent. It's now ninety percent of the time. So there's only a little a little peak here at the native state. Um, it's a bit noisier, so these peaks are broader. But there's at least three peaks here, uh, and these lengths are different. So if we compare the pattern of misfolding, it really actually does look quite different. So this is telling us that indeed we do seem to have templated propagation of misfolding in the sense that these two different mutants, which misfold differently, are inducing different kinds of misfolding in the wild type domain. So this is actually really exciting for us because we now have a single molecule assay where we can actually see a, 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 a single uh, misfolded molecule convince a, like basically take a, 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 a natively folded uh, molecule and turn it into another copy of the misfolded molecule, which is a direct uh, observation of, of, of the prion conversion mechanism. And so this opens actually many possibilities. Um, the, 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 one of the first ones that we're, we're excited to do is to explore how pharmacological chaperones, so small, uh, small molecule chemotherapy, chemotherapy agents, how they affect this, uh, this conversion process. And there's, there's a number of, of molecules that have been found to um, to have an effect on, on SOD1 misfo SOD misfolding, such as telbivudine and this uh, copper chaperone. Um, so our idea is to, to probe the mechanism of action of these, these things at the single molecule electric, uh, level directly to see how it's changing the, the, this process. Um, there's also some mutants like, like W32S that have been found to protect uh, SOD1 against misfolding. So we're, we're extremely excited to insert the W32S mutant into this wild type domain and, and then see if, if we see any conversion, like how much is it reduced uh, by, uh, by, by that mutation? And, and does it work equally well for the different mutations uh, using different, different misfolded mutants? And then, of course, that there's, there's the, this question of, uh, there's a wide range of pathogenic mutations, and so it, it would be interesting to see uh, 
to, to assess whether they all have this ability to convert uh, wild type uh, domains. Um, are, and if they do, are like for the ones that do, um, are there differences in the conversion mechanisms and, and are these related in any way to the speed of the disease progression? Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, conclude this presentation and uh, uh, thank the, the wonderful team of people who have worked on this, uh, these, these projects over the years. Um, and that's uh, Team Saad here uh, on the upper right, and then Team PRP down here. It's been a great cast of characters. Uh, and then, of course, our collaborators, our longtime collaborators on, um, on the work with uh, Prion Protein, Valerie Sim and uh, Leo Cortez at the, in the Department of Medicine and the Center for Prion Diseases. And then our longtime collaborator on SOD1, Neil Cashman, who's at UBC uh, Medicine. Um, and, of course, the funding agencies who have supported this over the years. And you for your attention. Thank you so much, Michael. It's wonderful and impressive how much resolution you've been able to uh, take a lot of these uh, four spectroscopy experiments. Really impressive. Thanks a lot. There are already quite a few questions in the chat. So the first question I see here is from Omar. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question directly? Can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, okay. Yes. Hi, Michael. Hi, I was just curious. Yeah, good to see you. Um, the uh, this is a question actually in reference way back to the very first result on the PRP single PRP with the rare misfolding that you resolved with the point spread function subtraction. Yeah. And that's just the question was if those such rare events could be explained by protein handle interactions. That was the, the question. So that is a a good question. Um, uh, we don't believe so. I think at one point we did a measurement with uh, PEG. Instead, we made a PEG handle instead of um, a DNA handle, and and uh, didn't see any difference. But I, it, that's far enough back that I'm actually not entirely certain about that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, generally with these proteins with some lysines in them, you might imagine there could be some electrostatic interactions, right? Yes. Uh, but we, we have not seen that, for example, in the other proteins that we've looked at that do have lysine. So that's, that suggested to us that it was, um, the, uh, that it was PRP specific. Cool. Thank you. The next question is from Miranda Lynch. Hi, can you hear? Yes. Yes. Great. Um, my question had to do with when you're generating the the, the dimers, um, so your homodimer uh, setup, where are you putting those linkers? And does what you see in those um, force diagrams actually depend on where you're generating those covalent attachments? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so the the linkers it's it's integrated into a single polyprotein construct so of course the linkers are from this the c terminus of one protein to the n terminus uh, of the other um, now in uh, in in sod the in the dimer those those two termini are actually really quite close to each other um, um, so you don't need a very long um, um, uh, linker to do that. Uh, attaching a linker in the other way uh, would be possible. It's it actually makes the um, but it makes the the construction of the of the dimer extremely difficult uh, because it means we have to bring in a a separate a whole other orthogonal um, chemistry uh, than the one that we're using to attach the handles. Um, Great, so we haven't you. looked at that yet. And the next question is from Dan Deviri. Thanks for the for the great talk, Michael. I was wondering because many times misfolding starts at uh, phase separated uh, membraneless organelles of of uh, of these proteins. I was wondering if it is possible to do these uh, force spectroscopy measurements 
in, in a solution that contains different proteins or even the same proteins that you are measuring only with uh, different concentrations? Yeah, well, so uh, in, in principle, it's possible. Um, the, we have to be um, we have to be careful because uh, aggregates, like if we have it at a concentration that's high enough where the protein is spontaneously aggregating, then the aggregates will actually, um, there are small dielectric objects that will fall into our trap. Um, and so then they'll generate all sorts of spurious um, signals. So that makes it slightly tricky. Um, now, you know, I've, I've been playing around with uh, the idea of trying to figure out if it would be possible to do these, um, like if we had, say, a third trap that could hold a, uh, a, um, um, a droplet uh, and just hold it over our, the, the protein that we're, you know, so you could, you could pull these proteins inside a droplet. That would be really cool. I still don't know how we would prevent other droplets from falling into the other traps and then, again, generating spurious signals. Um, so, so I think... You know, maybe there's something that could be done here, but it's going to require a lot of clever engineering of an assay. Thank you very much. All right. Now, our next question is from Pietro Faccioli. Hi, Michael. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, uh, you mentioned the problems of, of course, uh, dealing with the uh, Prion, prion uh, for hazards, essentially. Have you considered uh, you can, um, studying uh, head test prions? These are fungal, uh, fungal prions that do the conversion physiologically, so they're not linked to any pathologies. And we study that with biochemists and with simulations. And it, there's an interesting mechanism that we came up with, and it's uh, that uh, the conversions to the misfolded form occurs by transforming one strand at a time and in converting into the template one strand at a time. That would be easy to test, I guess, because you would expect a series of uh, similar elongation in your pooling experiments. Yeah, no, that's an interesting idea, especially because the if, if, I, if I remember correctly, the head S um, um, prion has a... I think that's the one that has a um, a beta solenoid structure, right? Which is similar to what right. is suspected to be the structure of PRPSC. Now that's a really interesting uh, yeah. Uh, idea. Yeah. I send you the, the literature. Yeah. Okay. Next question from Maurizio Brunori. Yes. Thank you very much. I had a simple question. I got a bit. Uh, confused uh, on the first part of the talk. I remember that uh, the PRP molecule is uh, part of it, a uh, substantial part of the molecule is uh, natively unfolded. I mean, and uh, the, the, the domain that is actually folded in the four helix bundle, uh, which then makes the transition is a, is a fraction of the whole molecule. Were your experiments carried out with the whole molecule or you chopped off this uh, tail? And where, uh, I mean, how did you attach the, the PRP to your uh, uh, <laughs> DNA, you know, st stretching uh, uh, molecules? Okay, so the, um, the, con the, the construct we're using is a, uh, a truncation mutant that truncates it at um, residue 90. So the um, so that truncates off uh, the octopeptide re uh, region, uh, but it keeps the part of the of the protein that is unstructured in the native state, but is part of the protease resistant core in the infectious state. So that was the that was the uh, that that was the motivation for keeping for using that particular construct. Plus, it's been shown that. You can actually generate from um, uh, recombinant that that particular recombinant truncation. You can generate um, uh, prions. Um, now, in terms of how we attach the handle, we then added a, a cysteine. We put in a cysteine at where? The end, and so we're 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 attaching via cysteine chemistry. Where did you attach the cysteine? Oh, we added it, We added them to the to the oh. termini, so that they're there's a, they're actually on the end of unstructured parts of the protein. I see. Yeah. And 
I mean, uh, do you think that this procedure of uh, having a modification and attachment, uh, you know, to the to the DNA is going to stabilize the misfolded state with the with the four beta sheets or uh, or what? Well, what the molecule that you are you are working with. <laughs> yeah. So. Um... Again, because the um, so the uh, be because the recombinant protein generally doesn't go into the the infectious state, which has this four you know we, we which is believed to be this four uh, ring mm -hmm. the solenoid. Um, it's you know it's it's hard for us to to test this out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, your recombinant protein doesn't doesn't populate that state. Well, not spontaneously, right? So, what obviously what we'd love to do is what we'd love to do an experiment where we have the we're holding, it's like the analog of what we did uh, with the sod, where we're holding a PRP monomer um, in, in our trap, and then we have some uh, infectious material like purified from brain or whatever in the solution, um, and then because that will in fact convert recombinant PRP, you can you, that that'll work. Um, in, at least in, in, in ensemble measurements. Um, so we'd love to do that. Uh, the problem, as I said, is that we currently can't do that because of the biocontainment issues. Uh, now, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to do this in a few years because uh, we recently got some funding to, uh, to build an instrument in our uh, prion containment, in a prion containment lab. Uh, but that, you know, it takes a while to get that up and running. Mm. All right, so the next question, or actually two questions from Ikoluza, which is probably not your real name, but no, uh, uh, Thank you. Um, my name is Ivan Koluza, and I'm okay. talking from uh, Biomaguna in Spain. Uh, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Uh, I start from the second question that is a bit more technical and faster. Uh, when you showed the experiments with the misfolded mutant connected to the wild type protein, uh, how can you um, exclude the possibility that the intermediate states that you see are in fact uh, just the misfolded the, the mutant binding to the uh, to the wild type protein and acting as a sort of a grafter, just stabilizing part of the protein and just changing the, actually the unfolding landscape? Um, well. Okay, that's that's a uh, that's a possibility. Uh, if that's true, then we would expect those those peaks that we saw in the um, in the distribution of lengths to match up with uh, peaks in the native folding pathway, right? For the for for a native, the, the idea being that okay, some point on the native folding pathway, the misfolded protein just binds and stabilizes, and it stops there. I think if I'm understanding well, right. Or, or it could just hold part of the protein more stable than normally it would not be. And then it would, the unfolding would start following a completely different path because it, it just unravels first different section that normally it would not unravel. Like if you just glue a bit part of the protein. I see. So, so I mean, so, so this would be a, this would be a, a misfolded protein induced misfolding. So it, it's, it's or not... a different unfolding pathway, if you want. Well, no, because what you're saying is that it's actually going into a non-native state that's uh, metastable, uh, that is induced by the misfolded mutant. Now, what you're saying is that it's not a monomeric state. It might be an uh, an aggregated state. Yeah, uh, but we don't actually, you know, we don't actually know that uh, uh, that when. Uh, conversion of sod happens that that it stays as a monomer, right? It may actually convert as as an oligomer. I see. Well, the, my first in original question is related to this, in fact. But uh, the, what I wanted to ask is that in in infecting the cell, proteins are exposed to many other different proteins uh, at the same time. So one interesting aspect that we studied uh, recently was the fact that if, uh, if you look at this process, it looks like aggregation and misfolding most of the time happens with copies of itself, of the same protein, regard, more or less regardless of what is around the, the, that particular protein. So in the sense in your uh, uh, landscape picture that you showed, it would suggest that these misfolded states that are 
inherent in the single molecule when it's alone somehow uh, starts to also recognize themselves in the right moment because otherwise if different misfolded states will start to meet from different proteins they should form all sorts of mixed aggregates but this doesn't happen so i was wondering if you have tried to pair your protein with just other proteins and see if while unfolding they start to also create different misfolded states or not yes that's an interesting idea um i was going to say that for the for sod uh, we, we know that when you've got another copy of itself right next by, right, that doesn't really induce all that much misfolding, right? That yeah. was, uh, um, for, for PRP, of course, that was quite different, right? When we put two of them together, then it always misfolded. Now, we actually, you know, we were interested in this question of whether those uh, unstable misfolded states that we saw in the monomer, you know, might be interacting together, uh, as you were suggesting. Uh, but as it turns out, you can... If you look, if you if you look at the the length scales, it um, it seems that that's not it seems that that's unlikely, um, because uh, the the very first thing that happens in the refolding of the PRP is the folding of a short um, piece of the of the protein that's uh, not you know it's it's not long enough to to if I've got two if I got like a a, a, a small misfolded protein. Uh, a small misfolded part of the of one domain and a small misfolded part of the other domain. We already know what the lengths are for those, but then there's the linker between them. So if they're coming together, that actually would give you a big length change, uh, and the length change that we see is is smaller than that. Wow, that's, uh, so, so at least so at least the the, tri the triggering event is not that. That does not mean that maybe those things are happening later on, but the triggering event is not that. Yeah, we see something similar in, in, with combining very different number of proteins in solution at different degrees of uh, denaturation, for instance, that they, that they indeed, they only start to show misfolding aggregation when they, you overcome a certain barrier of their own concentration. So suggest that only when this landscape that you talk about is short enough, but only for copies of the same protein, not the presence yeah. of the other. And, and of course, there's a there's a, a, a related point, which is that uh, in a lot of these neurodegenerative diseases, there are many there are different proteins that that uh, co-aggregate, for example, that are clearly associating. Um, and so that there's a lot of uh, you know there's a lot of scope for us to have a look at that too. So for example, like at ALA, at SOD interacting with TDP43 or PRP interacting with A beta, right? There's lots of possibilities there. Thank you. Okay, next question is from Lisa Lapidus. Lisa, please. Hi, Michael. Um, so my question has to do with the SOD1 uh, templating. So you showed that there's some templating from the folded state. Do you think there's um, templating from other states, unfolded, misfolded? Um, it was a little unclear what, how, what the pathways were. I'm sorry, the, the, what, what's the question? The question is, so for SOD1, you've seen templating from the folded state, but is the unfolded state also getting templated? Um, uh, is it going into a templated state or is it going from some misfolded state? Yeah, so we're still, um, we're still analyzing the refolding curves to, because we, yeah, because we, what we want to do is we need to analyze them all for the, you know, the sequence of, of, of intermediates and then show that we wanted to see if they were consistent with what we were seeing with for the um, the monomer alone, for example. Um, that analysis is, uh, my postdoc is still doing that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't talk about that. Um, yeah, and, and, and as far as the, the, the templating, I mean, it's, you know, it's still, it's tricky because we don't actually have a structure for the, either of those misfolded mutants. So it's hard for us to know exactly what we should expect to see. Okay, and next question is from Peter Wallens. Peter, please. Uh, it's just a simple question. Uh, well, first of all, it's very, very exciting work. And uh, also, I think it's not uh, that difficult for theorists to contribute to uh, finding the structures of these uh, intermediate uh, molecules. I think it's a very nice uh, a project. If I had people, uh, more people, I would <laughs> and less problem. <laughs> Excellent. I would have to look at it. But, um, uh, but um, I'm, you know, Michael Olenberg has done a lot on SOD using chemical denaturants, 
And I remember not, it's a very intricate story. And I thought it also involved data strand interchanges. Uh, I just wondered what's the relationship of your results to his, because of course, different kinds of denaturation, uh, you know, tilt the landscape in different ways. Uh, yeah. So you might have a yeah. different mechanism under force than under chemical denaturant. Yeah, so I, I mean, that's a, that's a very good question, Peter. Um, we, we were interested in this too, of course. Uh, and one of the, because as you say, you, you don't necessarily expect that it's going to be the same. Now, now obviously, the most obvious difference was that we saw a, a whole smorgasbord of, of, of uh, intermediates and as opposed to two-state folding. Mm -hmm. However, um, when we looked at the, like he's done, Oliverick's group has done a whole lot of um, uh, bio analysis. And right. To identify like yeah the the core of the transition state um, and it's interesting that the um, that analysis uh, finds a, that the transition state looks kind of like that what we called our 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 stable core right the stuff that we're seeing happening first um, mm -hmm. so so in fact you know the general architecture of what's happening uh, seems to be quite similar and that you have to make that first and that's kind of the big barrier. Um, it's just that then the, the details of the differences in how things are being denatured probably leads to this fact that we're seeing a whole lot of intermediates and he's not. Mm -hmm. That's sort of my picture of, of, of how those two, those two measurements are, are, are related. Yeah, I mean, it's quite easy for an intermediate under one type of tilting of the surface to become a transition state in another kind of tilting of the surface. And uh, that would be interesting to make a really detailed uh, comparison, I guess, but that, and again, theory could help tremendously with this. It's just a matter of having people to do it really. Yeah. But. I, um, I mean, of course, <laughs> the, the, like a, a, it would be very interesting to try something like uh, what uh, Susan Marcus's group did, right? Where you put in, you do both, right? You do both chemical and force denaturing. Right. right I, I right. suspect that that would be um, a little tricky in the case of this protein because the unfolding forces as you might have noticed, are all pretty low. Like everything's mm -hmm. happening below about 12, 13 picanewtons. Um, mm -hmm. So if we destabilize the protein more with the chemical denaturant, it might end up being sufficiently low that we, we can't really see things all that well. Uh, but Except, certainly... well, yeah, there are interesting things because you showed fairly clear what I would call backtracking. And backtracking has a sort of characteristic sign under chemical denaturant. So it would be a very nice yeah. experiment. Good. We have a few more questions, if you're still happy to go on, Michael. Yes, yes. Um, the next question is from Sunila Martic. Hi. Hi. Thank you for taking my question. I, I was really wondering about um, post-translational modifications and if you evaluated uh, I'm going to pick phosphorylation and its role on the process that you that you study particularly. Yes. So this is, I mean, this is this is a great question again, and um, it's something that we're very interested in, and we have started working on. Um, though not looking at phosphor phosphorylation, we're we're starting looking at um, um, uh, glycosylation because PRP is a glycoprotein, and as it happens. Um, there's, there's different strains of prion disease, and one of the characteristic markers of different strains is different uh, glycoforms. Um, so we are, we are in the process of, of doing this, um, uh, chemically glycosylating our, our PRP so that we can know exactly, you know, we can produce a, 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 a uniform glycoform and then see how that changes things. Um, we haven't started doing that yet with, uh, with um, uh, doing modifications yet with SOD. Thanks so much. And the uh, next question is from Liz Myring. Liz. Hi, Michael. Hi, Liz. Uh, thanks for the, for the very interesting talk. It's amazing all the different things you can see. And it went kind of fast. So I wondered if you could comment a bit more on how what you see might relate to what we saw in solution for misfolded monomers that were transiently misfolded or transiently associated. This is in the eLife paper. Uh, the work we did with Lewis, and it was certainly altered by mutations as well. 
And because what we saw was, um, you know, there was association between the natural dimer interface, but rotated, or you could kind of flip it over and take a loop. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, how do your results compare if you compare it to that? So, yeah, so some of those differences, I mean, like taking a, t taking two monomers and like rotating them like that, they, they end up generating relatively subtle changes in, in length. Mm -hmm. um, so they can, the, the, the problem is that like, I have a, we have a, we, 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 we want things to be different, to differ by roughly three standard deviations before we believe them. Sure. Um, and so that means we need the things to, you know, unless we've got an enormous amount of data, and this, this is where rare events become, or a very heterogeneous behavior becomes problematic, right? Because then you need mm. thousands and thousands and thousands of pulls in order to get enough to bring your errors down. Um, so uh, unfortunately, I, yeah. it's really mm -hmm. difficult for us to actually make that comparison. But I'm even thinking, like, does the linker matter? Like, do you know what kinds of linkers might allow for more freedom? Or, you know, I just, you said you tried PEG or whatever, nucleic yeah, so we acid. Haven't, we, haven't or, tried, we haven't tried PEG in the, in, in SOD. Um, we did in PRP and it didn't seem to make a difference, but we haven't tried it in SOD. Um, to link monomers, would you do that? Um, yeah, I mean, because that's the part I'm worried about, right? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, now it's it's fair it's it's fairly straightforward to um, um, to to for example compare a so our like our the dimer the wild type dimer that we were looking at had a relatively short linker uh, because of course those two ends are actually quite close together as we don't need in the native state yeah so it would constrain it I guess yeah so we could I'm we could uh, we. It's it's fairly straightforward to um, use that long linker, right? like a 50 amino acid linker, which gives it a mm. lot less constraints to see um, how that behaves. Um, and could you do something with lipids? So that's my other, I just snuck in a second question because it does misfold on the on the mitochondria. Yeah. So well, the um, lipids are challenging again because any once it uh, if we get stuff up above the critical micelle okay. concentration, then it generates my cells, which fall into the trap and then generate spurious. Mm, okay. Um, it, you know, you can do work with lipids in, in uh, the trap using like um, uh, those, uh, are those nano, um, you know, the little, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. but you have to be, you have to be extremely careful in how you do it. So it can be done. It's just, it's, it's adding another layer of difficulty to experiments that are already uh, somewhat challenging. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then we have a, a last question on the list. Oh, now it's the second to last. <laughs> uh, Pietro had another question. If it's a, a brief question, Pietro. Sorry, sorry for asking. I'll be quick. So uh, there's a paper coming out tomorrow on nature communication biology that we just got accepted and in which we show that we can sh lower the expression levels of prime proteins in cells by identifying molecules that bind to the protein, so to a protein folding intermediate. So basically what we do, we simulate the folding with enhanced sampling methods. We identify a, a short-lived intermediate, but sufficiently long that it can bind to small molecules. We screen uh, over databases and find the small molecules. And the idea is the cell gets rid of partially folded proteins through a quality control. And in this paper, we show that it actually works. And then we, you know, there's a company that we founded a few years ago that exploits that. But the idea is now, the question comes now, it would be very interesting to see whether, what I would expect from theory is that if our calculations are correct and the molecule acts exactly as we predict, I would expect that if the pooling visits the same intermediate, which is a question, I would expect that if I unfold, put the molecule in solution and then try to refold, I should have a harder times in trying to refold the protein because the molecule will stick in the intermediate if it's there, preventing the system to go back to the original location. Do you think this kind of experiment is technically possible or, or is not? Oh, uh, yes, uh, uh, yes. And we've actually done this kind of thing uh, with some other, oh. uh, some other small molecules. 
Uh, and there's there's a couple of wrinkles I should mention. So yeah, so we we ha I, there's a paper I didn't a couple of papers I didn't talk about looking at some um, some antibryon compounds. Uh, one of them was a a, a tetrapyrrole, um, which does bind. You know, it was found in a screen to bind to the native structure, but we also found uh, that um, it binds to unfolded and partially folded structures. Uh, and then the same thing is true of PPS, right, which is a polymer, which also has antiprion uh, properties. And it, in fact, sta uh, it really stabilizes a, a huge range of um, unfolding intermediates in the, uh, in the hamster PRP that we just n normally don't see. Um, there's another element which I should mention, which I didn't get into, which is we've done this, this work that's still not published yet. We're writing it up, um, comparing the folding of PRP from different uh, species. Um, because when we look at bankfold, for example, bankfold is interesting because it's the universal receptor of prions, right? Um, most species have a pretty strong species barrier. If I infect a hamster with cow prions from cows, the hamster generally doesn't get the disease unless I make it a transgenic one, so it's expressing cow PRP. Um, but bankfolds, you can infect them with any kind of, of you know, a prion from any species and it gets, they get the disease. So this is, of course, a very interesting uh, protein to look at. And when we look at that, it does have, in fact, a lot of intermediates. Uh, but surprisingly, so does PRP from species that don't get disease, like dogs. Um, so yes, we're very interested. I mean, this is, uh, we, we'd be happy to, you know, if you send us some of those compounds, we might be able to. Yeah, and because you see, the point is that you can show this pharmacological effect of intermediates in cell. Now we have plenty of evidence, but what we lack is a true biophysical experiment in yeah, which yeah, you no, take so away so all the cycle would, would be able to see this. You show by, it directly. Yeah, yeah, directly by, by binding to the one of those yeah. and capturing. So those. I'll write you an email. Right, yeah, so I'll write that. you an email. Okay. Okay, very good. And so now Thank we you. have the, the last question from King Shukosh. Kings. Hi, Michael. Hi. Thanks for the great talk. Um, very quick question, the conversion or sequestration, is it always stoichiometry one is to one? Or could it be, or if I have actually two of those sort of misfolded construct, will they actually sequester each other and not? Yeah. Um, so our, like in the, in the sod work, uh, by, by construction, the stoichiometry is one to one because I have one hmm. wild type domain and one. Um, um, but in yeah. reality, uh, in reality, uh, of, of course, um, I yeah, I'm clear. Um, I mean, in 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 prion diseases, we we know that these tend to happen in in aggregates, right? So the stoichio even there, the stoichiometry is unclear, right? Do they? Okay. Is it is it is it coming down and and converting? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's clearly, it's converting it on an aggregate. So I guess it's not one-to-one, -one, but it's, you know, we don't really know the, yeah. Uh, and in SOD, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure Thanks. whether it, 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 the conversion happens uh, just in monomers or, or, I mean, I would presume it, it happens also in, in aggregates. Um, and I don't know if the, that then this means that there's differences, right? Because presumably some of those, the structures in some of those aggregates are, may not be the same. Thank you. Okay, so I mean, I had quite a few questions. Maybe I can ask one final question. <laughs> you, you talked a lot about protein misfolding. My question was, how often do you see misfolding in things like RNA, for instance? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so fairly often, um, but like one of the things that we've discovered from our work on, on pseudonauts, on frame shifting pseudonauts, um, is that these structures that you know we initially thought were uh, non-native uh, uh, actually may still be functional in the sense that um, uh, we believe we've sh we've shown that uh, there, by looking at a so we had this paper a couple of years ago now. Uh, where we looked at, an, uh, at the frame shifting pseudonaut from the West Nile virus, which frame shifts at an extre extraordinarily high rate of around 80%. Mm -hmm. um, and what we found was that when you look at this, this RNA, 
you know, when you unfold and refold it, which is of course what's happening in the cell, the ribosomes are constantly going through it, right, and it's unfolding and refolding, is that um, it can form a bunch of different structures. Uh, and not all of them are pseudonauts. And in fact, it, none of those structures is occupied at, at a level that's high enough to account for 80% frame shifting. Mm. So there's no single static structure that's responsible for that frame shifting rate, uh, which corresponds to what we had already uh, expected based on our, our pulling data, that it's actually uh, the heterogeneity and the, the sort of the dynamic heterogeneity between different structures that can be formed by the RNA that actually is what induces, is part of the mechanism for inducing the, the frame shift, which suggests that then those, those non-native structures are actually still functional. Hmm. Now that's remarkable. <laughs> okay, so with that, thank you very much, Michael, for a fabulous talk. Thank you all for joining in for a wonderful discussion. It was great to see you all. Have a, a good, near, good uh, new year still. And uh, I hope to see many of you again in, in two weeks in the post-Trump era. And with that, have a good day. Have a good evening. Goodbye.